That's not an excuse here. <laughs> no? No. It's, it's started to be hot like a month ago. It will end in October. So uh, We'll see in a couple of minutes. kind of uh, funny but we'll do it anyway it's important that I know that Marianne is watching from home she told me um, what else are here. We'll go over, um, continue from where we stopped last time from the MVPA with the MVPA and continue with uh, representational uh, similarity analysis, which is very exciting. But first, since we're a small group, um, there's going to be an exam um, for those of you who need the credit. And it's going to be somewhere in the, the I would say, uh, th th there is no uh, date set. So because we're a very small group, I'm going to post like four or five dates or six dates in the beginning of July, all right? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send the mail today and please try, uh, I'll, I'll send a deadline by like by Wednesday or something. Give me dates that are good. If not, I'll just set a date. So I prefer to do it together with you because I think we are like uh, eight students and two, I guess, are not, uh, are you doing the exam? You're not, rich, but would you, you're not doing the exam. Okay. How about you? You don't need the credits also. So I think we're like five students who are doing the exam or something like that. So it's easy to set a time. But if you want set, so I, if, if you want reply, so I will just set one. So, um, all right. So let's finish with that. Um, I'm sure this is working. Okay. All right. So, um, Starting from where we finished last time, so uh, we covered the principles of multivoxel pattern analysis. Um, we talked about the idea that you can correlate between patterns of activity. You can take this a step uh, further and decode the activity. So try to predict from given patterns, uh, predict uh, get when the algorithm gets new patterns of activity, you can predict to a certain amount on the quality or the, the, the type of the stimulus or task uh, that um, those uh, patterns are uh, uh, reflected. And 
Today I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes uh, describing another paper uh, that expands this decoding a bit and then move to representational similarity analysis which take this even further. So just uh, um, bring it us all to the same page. We have a pattern of voxels in this case, two voxels let's say. So in this uh, voxel by voxel space, which is only two voxels here to make it simple, this type of pattern of activity appears here in this space. So more activity in voxel two, less activity in voxel one. And when I present a different pattern, the opposite pattern, more or less, it will be here, right? So more activity in voxel one, the yellow uh, uh, voxel, and less activity in voxel two. And if I collect enough of these uh, guys, I can uh, have a population of, uh, of activation in this space, and then I train a classifier to uh, I take some of the, uh, let's say, uh, some percentage of this uh, trial, save them as a test set, and with the other uh, remaining trials, I can uh, train the classifier to um, create some boundary. All right, and now when I uh, apply the, this uh, rule to the test set, um, I get a correct, uh, hi Peter, correct uh, um, classification for, uh, in this case, 75% of the chances. Okay, so the reds uh, should be below the boundary, the greens on the upper part of the boundary, and this is the idea of, of classification. So this is where we stopped. We talked about, um, last thing we talked about is the paper by Kamitani and Tong, which, uh, uh, they use some uh, classifier to detect preferences in voxels to orientations in uh, V1 and then in, uh, in the early visual cortex, basically. And now I'm going to take you uh, a short tour through another paper from Tong's lab. Uh, when, and I want to I use this paper to introduce just the, the, the notion that you can do this classification also with different trial types or different sets of stimuli, okay? To show some general rule that you uh, create, and if that general rule holds when you change um, classification, uh, and you change the stimuli, for example, the task um, condition, then it means something about the represent representation of that part of the brain. So for example, if I train um, classifier to distinct between houses and faces, and then I test it on animals and tools, and it's pretty robust classification, then this might not be animals, um, faces and houses, but something that dis uh, distinguish inanimate from animate objects, for example, okay? So this is a very strong thing. If you can do that, it says uh, something uh, pretty nice. But you can also do it not on different type of, of um, stimuli, but on different uh, task conditions, um, and we'll get to that in a second. So let's first describe the task I'm gonna talk about. Um, there are two tasks. The main one is a memory task in which uh, uh, people were presented with two samples of gratings with different directions, okay, following each other in time, 200 milliseconds each. Then there was a queue. Only then there was a queue to, uh, um, that indicates which one of the samples you should hold in memory. Then you uh, keep this uh, um, well, sample in memory. Uh, for 11 seconds, and then you can respond, uh, and you have to say uh, if the, I think, if the test sample is uh, clockwise or anticlockwise from the one that you should have remembered, okay? So it's a very simple design, and the idea is um, that the queue that's important is only presented after the samples, okay? So when you view, you don't know which one of the queues of the samples you need to remember, okay? That's critical. And now, what, um, so first the, the, the basic bold response for this kind of experiment in different uh, early visual cortex area from V1 to V4 is what you see here, and you can see um, basically two responses, okay? One for seeing the um, stimuli, and another one for the answer, basically, okay? And you can see also that because there was enough time, um, signal comes back to baseline more or less. Most of the signal does anyway, all right? By the time we're at around uh, 11, uh, uh, well, 14 uh, seconds, 
which is, this is stimulus onset. Uh, no, this is not stimulus onset, I'm sorry. Stimulus onset is somewhere here, I don't remember exactly. It's uh, early, but uh, this uh, gray part, oh, here it is. This is the stimulus onset. The gray part is the part of the signal that's going to be analyzed right now and classified. Okay? And uh, as you can see here, no physical stimulus is apparent at that time. Okay? So this should represent some kind of, if, if you can code the orientation of the um, presented stimulus here from this part of activity, it means that this part of the, um, well, what you decode now is something that is being preserved in memory. Yeah. Sorry? The bold? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, we'll get to that in a second, but yeah, you're right. Uh, in the test, uh, I, I see, I see something. You said there is no yes. physical stimulus. No, no, there is physical there stimulus, is. yeah, but there's a considerable delay between the physical stimulus and the, ta and the part of the ball that you uh, ah. analyze. Okay. okay? So it's true that it's some of this activity, but we'll get to the details later. I'm not sure we get the actual, to the actual details of everything, but initially you have some um, response to the stimuli themselves. That's clear. That's, I guess, what you asked, that the response is finished. Um, all right. So um, let's see what they found. And again, I'm not going to... We don't have time, so I'm not going to go into the specific details, but I want you to, to use this as an example to how you can, uh, first of all, uh, manipulate the, the task in such a way that it will give you some added value as not only the decoding of actual stimuli, but the decoding of some um, yeah, mental state, let's say. And another thing is the cross-categorization, uh, what we talked about. So first, let's see the main results, which is the green um, line here, green line, and you can see it for the different uh, visual areas, but also on average, not average, but cumulative. And what you see is there's 50% uh, uh, accuracy uh, classification uh, by chance, and you are well above it. You're around uh, 70 or 75%, uh, I mean, all uh, regions. Okay, so this is, uh, again, I'm not going to talk too much about it. It's another result, like the one we saw last week, like many other decoding results. But again, it's something that is, um, is, is dis disconnected from the actual stimulus presentation. It may be some, you, ca you can say that this is some kind of residual from the uh, image that you, uh, that you saw. That's perfectly fine, but that this is exactly the point. You have some residual, okay, which still carries information about what you saw 10 seconds ago or uh, five seconds ago, okay? So, um, so that's, one, that's one thing. And another experiment, uh, experimental condition they had is some kind of, uh, they presented, I don't remember the timing exactly, but they presented again uh, these uh, um, two directions of stimuli, of, of gratings, and they had some foveal task not related to those, like uh, distinguishing between a K and a J, I think, some kind of discrimination, the fovea. And then um, they checked if you can classify, this time not uh, from memory, but just on the actual stimulus time, if you can classify unattended stimulus. So basically, the level of, uh, when you take now the onset of the stimulus, take the activity there, see if you can classify um, what, what was in the background. And they found uh, this red bar. These, these are the results. As you can see, you have very high classification. What uh, do you mean by background? Sorry? The, the gray things are in the background. But you are um, concentrating on the, on the changing characters in the middle. Okay. All right? But still, from the brain activity, you can infer what was in the background, what kind of grading. 
why do you think uh, the, the it drops uh, in the in V4? Let's say it's still significant. It's still like high classification rate, but why does it drop so much? What do you know, maybe about V4 or in relation to what we see here? Any ideas? Don't have to know, but V4 is was, well. We know there's a lot of uh, attentive interactions going on in V4. We know that there are many attentional signals, spatial attention, uh, that in integrate and interact with the representations in V4. It's been shown in many, actually most um, findings in, in, in feedback connections in the visual system are in V4. Uh, of course, there are also earlier. But the fact that the ratings weren't attended may affect V4 more. And finally, we had this um, generalization task, okay, which shows uh, less, uh, the performance is, 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 is somewhat uh, less good, but still uh, better than chance and quite significant. And this is when you train the classifier on one task and test it on, a, on another, okay, so, and it's vice versa, okay, so it's, it's average about, uh, for both directions. So if I train on um, the unattended gratings, I get some boundary. Now I attend for the grating, but check the memory. I can, by the rule I established by, from, the, from viewing the unattended, but on time, unattended uh, stimuli, I can now decode what is uh, retained in memory and the other way around. Okay? So this is, this is nice, because this shows you, well, together with the other results, that there is some kind of um, computational circuitry there as early as V1, okay, that uh, has some, um, well, participate in both, hope you can't say that for certain, but it looks like participates in also when you only see something passively, when you see it actively, attend to it, and also when you retain it to memory. And, Actually, this was the first, uh, well, not, I'm not, not sure if the first, but one of the, the earlier uh, cases in which they show that retaining memory, visual memory, actually um, has an effect down to V1, all right? So usually you talk about uh, hippocampus and parahippocampal area and uh, some back, uh, backward connection to V4, you talk about parietal areas. So it still doesn't tell you where exactly the memory is, is being uh, properly, it's not being uh, processed there, but the circuitry in V1 is being somehow used, okay, in this process. So that's something new, and it tells you something new about the visual system, how it works when no stimulus or when you have to keep something in, 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 in memory. Another interesting uh, uh, thing to be noted is the timeline. And uh, of the of the uh, ability to classify, and this is again for for the two, exper two experiments, and this is relative to uh, the onset of the gradings. Okay. So, if you remember, let's see if I have it here. Let's talk about the green one, for example. Uh, if you remembered um, the bold signal, this is this is referring to what Peter asked. The bold signal drops down quite, uh, well, it drops down, basically goes back to baseline. So if I would uh, test for significant percent of uh, signal change, let's say, I would probably get it around here, right? And I will get nothing significant here if I check the timelines. But the classification stays, so it, it, it stays very significant um, afterwards. Um, uh, what does it tell us? Well, first of all, it tells us just something uh, very general about how we should treat bold, basically, okay? And, 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 and the limitations and, and, and interpretation of each, of each thing and, and of each, let's say, approach or method. All right, so if we have, um, if we, well, if, if we check, first, so first of all, the, about the approach, if we check, uh, um, uh, just a uh, response, basically, percent signal change. We are usually talking about onset response, okay? And this is enough. However, 
the um, classification, first of all, in, in, in addition to open, us, open up for us uh, opportunities to look at the different, I would say, uh, spatial organization or spatial resolution by the combination of vectors, gives us some kind of, um, even, you know, it's not accidentally, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a niche. It's not the main thing that you use, for, uh, use uh, MPPA for, but you can see that it can add information even uh, in a temporal domain. And this is for the approach. And here what, well, let's hear from maybe from you. If not, I will tell you. Um, what, can you well, what can you say, first of all, about the difference between this graph and that graph in time, what we talked about. So what, how do you interpret this uh, uh, elevated uh, classification power and no, uh, well, reduced uh, bold activation? And the other, uh, other question is, uh, if there's some difference between the red and the green here, what is the difference and how do you interpret it? Have any ideas? For the first question is really ideas because there is no one absolute answer. I cannot tell you an answer about what's what's really going on here, but we can try to think about it. Let's start from the second one. We see some. Uh, uh, what do you see about the, uh, uh, the unattended gradients, the red one versus the green one? The red one starts a bit earlier. At least. What do I mean by start? It's not that the response starts earlier. Again, it's the ability to classify the stimulus from the response start earlier. Okay? Uh, it's just, I think, again, I'm not sure, I think it's a reflection of the processes here. Okay? One is derived maybe from really bottom-up experience, right? We just see the gratings unattended or, you know, or not attended. It doesn't matter, but especially here when it's unattended. Okay? And the other one, the working memory, probably um, has something more complex going on in the background. Okay, there's some kind of an effect of a, of a feedback um, or attentive, right, or attentive mechanism because you're uh, required. For, think, think about the task for a second. You saw some things, okay, and then there was a cue, right, and you knew from the task that only after the cue you know which one to remember. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different process that's going on here. You know that you have to kick in your uh, uh, keeping the representation in mind, like probably a second later when the queue comes, you know what you need to do. And here, it's something different. So, so this is a reflection of the two different processes, I think, that's going on here. This is also their um, explanation, although they cannot be sure. As for the other, uh, for the other thing, it's just, I have to think about it also, but, but it just shows you that um, activation and information are not always the same, okay? And this goes back to, the, to the, uh, what we said that MVPA allows you to do, is go beyond uh, uh, telling which voxel is active in which uh, task, or which region is actually active in which task, to tell you something uh, about what is, what is represented. And this, this thing, again, if we believe MVPA, so we believe that classifying something hints that the relevant information is there in the voxels. You don't have to believe it, by the way, but, but this, is, this is the assumption. All right, if you believe that, then you have to realize that um, the just just it emphasizes that the strength of the response or the or um, yeah the amplitude of the bolt doesn't tell the whole story okay so it's just a, a, a way to emphasize that yes you can do a lot of things with just seeing what is more active or what place is more active at a time but it really doesn't tell the whole story and in this specific uh, uh, research, they also showed that this decoding ability was uh, really not correlated with the amplitude of the individual response of the subject. Okay, so they actually show it. So the ability to decode has nothing to do with the, uh, um, like I said, with the amplitude of the rise and the fall of the signal. Um, all right. Yeah, 
so the uh, the, the you, you get this classification curve for each individual, and you get the dynamics of the bold response, and the amplitude and delay of the bold response are uncorrelated with the with the timeline of the classification. Okay. The development of the classification is not related to the development of the individual bold response. All right. So again, it, it it's just whoa. I have something with the. Uh, I don't know why it moves like. Moves automatically. There's something wrong with my computer. Yeah, a lot of graphs. Don't worry. We won't. This is like until the next year. I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is everything I have to say about RSA and MVPA in, in uh, <laughs> descending order of importance. So we won't get. Uh, yeah. It's all for the exam. Don't worry. Um, yeah, okay, so there's, so there's, it's, uh, there's a dissociation between the information you can find in the multivoxel multi patterns than the uh, robustness of the bold activation, okay? So, so it, it shows you just, again, that some uh, uh, parts that may be considered residuals or they're less robustly activated can actually hold very valuable information. Maybe it's because uh, I missed last week, mm -hmm. but Yes. So how is it no. correlated? This, this graph, the second one, uh, or this? this? Oh yeah, it is. This, no, but this is not bold. This is classification accuracy. So at each time point. But the, but, but yeah, the yeah, it's, it's is based on bold. So, so what happens here is at the time point six, okay, you take uh, this signal, this signal, okay, all right. You have the betas or, uh, or whatever you do with the signal. And you uh, insert it to the classifier, right? It's the pattern of the voxels, and you get a high classification rate. Well, not so high, but still 65. Okay. Then you go, for example, at, uh, at uh, this time point, you get uh, around 70 percent uh, uh, classification, right? But this is the uh, level of the signal that you use, right? Okay. So this change in the intensity is not reflected in the accuracy, but also between subjects, this is average. So for subject one, uh, this peak will re reach here and subject two is reaching, reaching here, but the uh, actual classification uh, um, level could be still be the same or be reversed. It's unrelated to the individual uh, amplitude and to the development of the time, in, the, in time. All right, so RSA, or Representational Similarity Analysis. Uh, one minute to, to sum up what we had until now. So um, let's see if I have it. I have it in a few slides. So we started uh, with a board, and then we moved to some uh, uh, um, statistics and consideration we have to make. Then we uh, covered the GLM and how you use contrasts Okay, in ROIs, or you do an ANOVA on the brain, and you have uh, some kind of uh, average of voxels. If these are the voxels, you average them out. You have, let's say in this case, two conditions. You have two values, one for each condition. Okay, this could be betas, or this could be time courses, or whatever. And you can contrast them. All right, you do uh, t-tests for, uh, for, or whatever, whatever model you want to do. Okay. Next, we talked about uh, MVPA. MVPA, the idea is that you don't average the voxels, but you take the specific pattern. Okay, specific patterns hold a lot more information. Now you can um, find differences in the specific patterns, even though that, even though that uh, in some cases, the average of this and this could be the same, but still, um, the pattern itself was different. That allows you to uh, have more sensitivity, basic, basically, about seeing differences that you can't see in, uh, in uh, the univariate design. Now comes in RSA. So RSA, if somebody was uh, in the conference, in the workshop that we had like a month and a half ago, uh, Jorn Didrikson, uh, we said he's, he's going to talk about decoding, and the first thing he said is, I'm not going to talk about decoding. Decoding is the past. 
Um, the conduit is, he didn't say that, but he told me that uh, when we talk later, the conduit thing is, well, he didn't say it's dumb. It says, he just said that it's, it's the opening. It's, it's like, it's the first step we had to take to understand what we see. And I agree in some sense, and some sense don't. So decoding is very, very useful to see if you have some information represented here or there. It's very, very useful as a first step, and it's also very, very useful if you want to read to some kind of application, read the um, uh, brain activity in a region by EEG or MRI, and do something with this activity, okay? If you think about a wheelchair that you can decode uh, thinking left and thinking right, right, and move the wheelchair, decoding is excellent. And it's also excellent for th things like we saw, okay, to understand if what is decoded there is the um, animate in animate or faces, uh, so faces and um, houses, for example. However, we can, we can dig in further and we can actually create metrics that describe the information space that we have. So the first stage again was finding out which voxels are participating in which task. Next step was um, termed in information analysis, okay, see what kind of information uh, or is there, I would say, is there an information about the category, about the color, so on, so on, so forth. And now we're talking about metrics. And metrics allows us, um, first of all, usually but not always, we're, expand, we're going to expand the uh, stimulus space so it will be more detailed. Okay, so we're not talking, at least in the work we'll see today, but it doesn't have to be like that. We're not talking about two categories or two conditions. We're talking about single stimuli, okay, mapping some space, and we can decide which, which is the proper resolution to map that space, okay? So it could be... Um, uh, just house uh, animate and animate object, two categories, but it could be um, some kind of, um, I don't know, we can create some kind of uh, artificial uh, elements, artificial stimuli that change gradually from in animate to animate somehow or from uh, circular to square or whatever you kind of parametric design you want to uh, uh, check. And you can also uh, present like uh, Nico Kriegescorte did and we're going to talk about his work the rest of the day, um, presented just a bunch of stimuli that you can think about them as, as changing, as uh, um, belonging to different categories, but they can also vary according to, I don't know, color or shape or whatever. And you try to understand what, are, what is the metric that describes, okay, this set of stimuli uh, the best. And through that, you understand what that what are the rules by which the representation in that particular brain region, um, uh, what are the rules that, the, that apply to that uh, brain region? And this in turn, again, this is the end of the uh, presentation, the, the, the forward for this part, it, this kind of descriptive, descriptive uh, uh, metrics helps you um, quite simply, relatively simply, compare what you have with models or behavioral, like behavioral models, computational models, and, uh, and such. We'll see, we'll see examples soon. So let's uh, follow what I just said and talk about, uh, so Nicholas Creek has scored uh, uh, several really pioneering uh, um, paper works, uh, projects in the last 10 years, establishing really this field of, 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 of representational uh, similarity analysis, he and uh, Jorn Didrikson and others. So we're going to follow his work, and his work start well, not started, but this is, I think, the first very famous work of his. They took uh, 92 images that could be, again, could belong to either animate and animate the vision, or faces and animals and human-made objects and such. But the idea is, for the beginning, to ignore these um, categories and just present them single presentation of these 92 images. Okay? Well, by single it could be repeated, but just present an image and have a predictor for each image. Okay? Treat them single in the model. And the basic idea of, of uh, RSA, or basic tool, is building uh, RDM. RDM is representational dissimilarity matrix. Okay? So it's just the 
uh, opposite of uh, similarity. Yeah, no surprises there. And what you use is a one minus the correlation. Okay, and uh, you do that for mathematical consideration, but also conceptual. So you 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 change correlation into distances, and we'll 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 see next slide or the one after that why that is convenient. But the idea is, again, you have a single, in his case, in this case, uh, series of studies, you have a single uh, object and you have some kind of averaged um, vector of voxels average across repetition of that object. Okay, so a single vector uh, representing the pattern for each one of the objects and you correlate between the vectors, between all possible objects, okay? So you have 92 by 92 uh, possible correlations in, in this uh, uh, um, specific example, and you plot them, and you usually give a, a color uh, scale for those uh, correlations, and this is what it looks like. So what do we see here? All these RDMs, which again, this is the main tool that you use, are uh, symmetrical, okay, along this diagonal, so every one of uh, these uh, um, exemplar has a correlation with every one of the same exemplars, okay? So you can only use half of this. And as you can see, it can be divided to um, um, subcategories or categories. And it's nice actually to divide it because then we can see if there is some kind, even before we test it uh, statistically, we can see if there is some kind of structure here, okay? So for example, the blue ones are less dissimilar, so they are more similar, okay? The blue, the blue uh, dots, and we'll talk about the IT and uh, monkey IT and human T in a second, but just how to read it. So this uh, face with that face has a very high correlation and very low distance between them, okay? And what you can see, basically, first of all from here, is what kind of structure do you see here? The most uh, um, obvious one? Animate, animate correlate with animate, inanimate correlate with inanimate. Okay, that's very simple. You have some, even here, something more even. Faces correlate with faces very, to a very high degree. Um, Uh, there, there are more, more repetitions. Yeah, there are more. I don't remember much. So Probably 12, 12 repetitions or something. 12 repetitions. Um, so can you explain maybe uh, what each actually means? Because it, like, it makes sense for me to repetitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So, right. So, what do you, what do you how do you feel, let's go back uh, one back here. How do you feel this matrix, okay? So basically, like classification, you have these runs or subsets of uh, repetitions, okay? And you have values, let's say beta values or T values for them that you extract. We talked about that, all right? And then what you just what you do here is just correlate one with the other. So you could do this again with uh, two halves of the data, even versus odds, okay? Or you can do that uh, uh, for uh, with some kind of iteration. But what you see here, what you see uh, here actually is it's got nothing to do with that. So what, what you do is you get the correlation. So this axis and that axis is exactly the same axis. All right? That's why if you look closely here, the main diagonal is always zero. Because this one and the arc of triumph there is exactly the same data. All right? This is exactly the same data. So the correlation is by, it's obligatory to be zero here. You can see it uh, closer, you can see it here, right? So because we are talking about um, the same da data in both axes, so uh, they are completely correlated and the distance is zero, and that's why you actually can forget about one half of them. It's, okay. it's, it's totally symmetrical, okay? Um, so what did, they, what, what did they do in this specific uh, experiment? Uh, they did something very nice. They showed the uh, um, same images for two monkeys and for, I think, maybe four or six humans. I don't remember. And again, I don't remember now the repetition number. 
maybe I have it here. Yeah, no, I have some other things. They uh, they selected. We talked about it also before uh, last week. They selected for the analysis the 300, yeah, and 16 most visually responsive voxel in IT. We talked about it that usually you want to do some kind of uh, localizer, the independent localizer, and then uh, pick up the most responsive voxels, not more distinct, not the one that has more discrimination, but just more visually responsive, and do the analysis there. Okay, and they had some uh, in the monkeys, some 700 uh, neurons that they recorded from, and they created this kind of um, mi one minus r. Okay, this dissimilarity matrix for each one of the uh, of the data sets. And what's nice about it is, first of all, by its own, if you only take the human, you can already see that picking up those voxels in the inferior temporal cortex, um, you have some kind of structure. Okay, you have some kind of, like we said, an initial uh, animate and animate um, division. Uh, maybe you could see that in a um, univariate analysis. Not sure. It depends if it averaged, right? If in the same voxel, half of the neurons respond to animate, half of the neurons respond to inanimate, you wouldn't see anything. If there is some kind of a different distinction, you would see it. You would probably see it in a, a classifier. So if you give one set of animate, one set of inanimate, we would probably see um, uh, a good uh, discrimination. What you won't see is uh, some other structures that are just, you know, they pop out of the data. And we will see next slide how you visualize it better. But um, like you said, there's some kind of space within the animate. There's a face group and such. And another very important thing, and, and this will also come up later, we'll have a... Um, couple of minutes break uh, soon. You can also match, in this case, um, two, uh, data from two, two different species, but you can, instead of the monkey IT, you can have here a behavioral uh, uh, result, okay, or an, and um, some kind of computational model, it doesn't matter, we'll see examples later. But the idea is because you're talking about correlation, or one minus the correlation here, you can actually um, describe how much, for example, this data explains this data, okay? How much is common, how much, in, in, in more uh, official terms, how much variance here can be explained by this, for example. This gives you a measure of the similarity between these two, um, in this case, the visual system or the way objects are represented in the IT in monkey and human, but if, for example, this, mod, this uh, um, RDM, this huge RDM, would build by a kind of a, some kind of model, logic induced by a model, okay? So there's a model that uh, have some uh, I don't know shape uh, or shape gradient or uh, color gradient or whatever, and that is some kind of sphere model. And if you build the model, you, you build the RDM such that it represents the model. And then you can see, first of all, by looking, you can see how much, uh, how much it, it, they are similar, but you can also quantify how much the model is able to, exp to explain, how much the variance in this correlation matrix the model is able to explain. So that's a very, very nice tool that, and if it explains a lot, it's, well, it's a hint that the representation, again, it, here we're talking about correlation between multivoxel representations. So each correlation, each dot here, is uh, you know how this uh, voxel um, in, in condition one, uh, how they correlate between the uh, this collection of voxels. So it's the same voxels, but in condition one, condition two. All right. So we're talking about some kind of a relationship for the population of the of the region of interest in this case. And if there is a model that can respond, uh, that relatively well uh, describes the relationship between the, these uh, uh, patterns, okay, so it's a, it's a hint that this these, the feature that are dominated in this model or the feature that drive this model are crucial or the cardinal part of the representation there. Okay, but we'll see it soon. I hope to give you an example. But for now, I want you just to, let's take a couple of minutes break.
but are we good with the, the basic idea of this, okay? You can dive in, use exemplar if you want, and you can try to um, explain the data better. better. All right. Let's have a coffee break and uh, continue in 10 minutes.
né? Ok. So, um, like I said, this uh, bringing this uh, patterns of activation, correlating between these patterns, in putting them in some kind of uh, this great matrix, can bring interesting results, and can also allows you to connect different branches or different. Um, methods, different species, different models in neuroscience. And this is another example of that. So um, this, oh, this is, sorry, this is still the same example. We'll get to the next one uh, uh, in a minute. But this is a visualization, okay, in uh, uh, multidimensional uh, scaling, or sometimes you see it's called MDS. And the idea is, again, is that you, uh, this is a vis purely visualization uh, um, tool, and you can use this uh, uh, correlation, this RDM, this great matrix that we saw before, and you can um, draw it in this kind of dimension that encompasses basically your whole stimulus space, okay? So, you have um, objects that appear closer hmm, in the RDM, appear closer here, Okay, there are algorithms that do that, and then you can uh, um, again it's a visualization tool. You can see the uh, uh, how much similar are this uh, distribution. You can also, if you reduce the information here to the categories that we use, you can see again the body and the face and the natural artificial objects on the monkey IT and the human IT. You can see the striking uh, resemblance. Um, it's kind of tricky because it's always important to see these kind of images together with the RDMs, okay, to understand what the actual correlations. You can kind of distort these to emphasize, you know, some kind of clustering or some kind of, you can play with those. So you have to be kind of careful when you do that, but what they represent still hold, okay? So this is a true reflection of the data. Um, you can also um, continue and analyze the data, and again, using uh, the same basic uh, uh, matrix that you have, the RDM, okay, the uh, representational dissimilarity matrix, you can represent it in different ways, and this is a very nice uh, way that really highlights the uh, structure of division, again, of the patterns that uh, are paired with this kind of, uh, or uh, the represent um, in the voxels that were selected, these uh, stimuli. And again, what you have here is minus 1 minus R, so these are actu the actual um, values from the big matrix that you have. But um, you can, uh, th this basically, uh, the size of the, um, the height of each, basically, connection between each two pair of stimuli, represents the amount of dissimilarity. So, like for example, let's see it here, it's, it's easier to see. In the human, you have the first division between, okay, uh, inanimate and animate object, although there are some exceptions. And you can see by the height of this uh, division, okay, that it's really, uh, they're really uncorrelated. So these are the blue and the red ones from the matrix, okay? This is the first distribution that you have, okay? Um, and going on and on, uh, and you can divide this, uh, divide this data, all right? And if, for example, these specific two faces are very highly correlated relatively, okay? In the human and in monkey, actually these two are uh, the most correlated ones, okay? About uh, 0 0.5 R, the, 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 the coefficient. Um, so, of course, there are differences, but you can get a sense of the resemblance between the species. You can get some, you can quantify this again. You can do another quantification level by extracting this uh, structure, okay? This, this, this kind of representation has uh, 
the vision, the, uh, the tree is represented, and the different heights and the subdivision are represented. Okay, so you can do nice things to highlight your point, but again, it all comes down to the RDM that you're using. Okay, and the fact that for this case, there was some logic in building this RDM. Okay, and the logic is you don't have to put it like that. You can, when you, when you uh, create the RDMs, of course, you, you can just shuffle these. Right, and you don't get the structure. Of course, the, the data would be the same, but it's easier to build the RDM with some kind of um, division in this case, okay? To highlight again uh, in the presentation to highlight the structure here, but of course it has no meaning. But the basis, the basis for all of the uh, uh, subsequent analysis, analysis or, or, or visualization modes is the same one minus R. Um, coefficients between the vectors. All right, that's clear. I'm not going to go into the specific of this. First of all, I don't remember. Second of all, it, it's less important. Each algorithm has its benefits, but the idea is the same. Yeah. And the different colors. Um, no, this is just with visualization here. Yeah. Yeah. This is just to highlight the different categories. That that the data it's, it's the data is there without the colors. Okay. All right. So um, if we, if yeah. We would like yeah, here, here. This is this is the same data, or it's not exactly. Maybe it's, it's 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 data taken from the same research. Maybe not the same uh, dendrogram that we saw before. But this is uh, an, uh, basically in a review research that was done uh, like uh, three years later. I think they used the same data, and they wanted to prove a point, and they divided this further. Okay, but again, this is to make a point to visualize something. Um, but this kind of division can serve as a basis for the next assumption, okay? Now you can build a different experiment with a more sophisticated, more complex, more uh, true to the data assumption, okay? And go further. But again, it, it, it gives you, like I said, I repeat it many times, it gives you the ability to compare between a model and a, an fMRI data or fMRI data and non-animal, non-human data, for example, and also uh, gives you the ability to quantify, okay? You, you, you have some kind of uh, a, a value, basically. There's similarity or dissimilarity of value. If you have a space of features, you can see that this, uh, these two, in that space of feature, these two objects have a, 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 a distance of two, and these two objects have a distance of 5.5, okay? You quantify everything. And uh, this is just to show you one of the controls they did is in this specific experiment, you found no structure in the early visual cortex, okay? And this is one of the controls they did to show that there is no, um, that you're, well, there is some structure here. You can see, you can spot the little structure here. It's kind of hard here. <coughs> but some of the faces share, uh, they're very similar. And that makes sense also because visual cortex, uh, those faces, there are specifically human faces also, they probably have a lot of visual features that they're sharing, right? But in general, what the, the early visual cortex is probably ruled by different sets of, of uh, different division, all right? If we can, maybe we can find some structure here if we organize these by, I don't know, mean luminance or uh, a local contrast. And again, you can quantify it. All right, so going, uh, uh, going further with this, this is just um, uh, some kind of... Uh, Animate in animate contrast that was found in uh, um, paper by Don and the uh, uh, human IT. It's not important, but what we're going to do now is going to dive even further and and uh, uh, see how we can use this kind of data um, not only to compare between species but to get more well intuition of what's going on in the human brain. So again. You have some kind of uh, stimulus, okay? So this stimulus has uh, some kind of pattern. This stimulus has some kind of pattern. You correlate between each pair of stimulus. You get a correlation coefficient. You are usually present it by mi one minus that correlation coefficient to describe the distance between them, okay? But like I said, you can use this now to build, you can build other RDMs that are not necessarily from uh, monkeys but they are uh, derived from, again, a model, like uh, if we take the stimulus, we can uh, um, 
model the uh, similarity that people report on the stimuli. We can model the actual similarity by a pixel-to-pixel -pixel algorithm that checks the, the, the physical similarity. We have some computational model that we build and is able to represent this uh, stimulus space in a certain way. And we see, want to see if the brain or this region that we investigate does, does it the same way. Okay? And what, what, what we can, um, we can do this in, in, in different levels, okay? So, so the, first, uh, uh, the first thing we do is, like I said, we can um, see the structure row by, by row, column by column, just see how much variance is explained by the model, the RDM of the model, or the behavior for the RDM of the, of the fMRI data, and see some kind of variance explained. We can also um, have some assumption about the model that can explain um, the RDM best. And we'll see it again, we'll see it in example soon, but let's say we talk about uh, before the um, um, animate in animate uh, model that is basically something like this. We have this part is animate, animate correlation with animate, and these, these animate uh, in animate in animate, and these are the device, the one that crosses the um, category boundary. So we can try to model this to see how much such a model, ex how much variance can such a model explain in our data. Okay? And then we can have a a more fine detail model and see how much variance that model explains the data. We'll see this in a minute. But what, what this figure, again, uh, taken from a different paper by Krieg Skorte, what it uh, um, also shows us, that you have much more information here than the classification. And let's say we have two sets of stimuli belonging to two different categories. You can see, now I really need the, Right. I'll try to throw <laughs> markers on there. But uh, uh, you can see that um, you have this kind of di um, different grouping or different metrics, okay, that cannot be captured. The difference between them may not be captured by classifier, for example. So, for example, if you have a classifier that successfully discriminates this group and this group, linear classifier, it will also discriminate between this group and this group. However, the representations of this group and this group are differently. They're, 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 they're uh, differently represented. Something really um, like, may, like in a major way. Okay, the same here. Okay, the same classifier will uh, be able to classify this group from that group. Okay, so we have like at least you know, four or five uh, different ways in which the representation space is built, and the classifier by itself could not help us discriminate them. However, these kind of changes will be reflected to some point, okay, if they're strong enough, be reflected in the structure of the RDMs, okay? So, uh, that one will look like this, all right? And uh, this one will look like that, or and so on, okay? We will we'll not go into this. This is just to, uh, this is only hypothetical, but the idea is we got more information. And again, like I said, it might not be important to understand this exactly. For example, if I want to decode the mental state of moving the arm right or left to move a robotic arm, okay? It's not important if it's represented like this or like that. But if I want to see inside this uh, uh, mental state of thinking right or left, if I'm thinking about the exact degrees of right, for example, so this model, this thing, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a different thing to say about the brain if that area represents all right, let's say, 45, 60, and so all these degrees are represented like this or they're represented like this in some orderly fashion in that area. And it's, it says something different about the architecture of the information represented in the brain, okay? So I can model, model this or can extract, I can use models, I can just see what the data gives me. Okay, let's start going over examples to make it, you know, less uh, like something uh, uh, speculative and unattached to anything, amorphic. So we saw this, 
this is uh, similar data, it's not the same data, it's a different group of people, if I'm not mistaken, um, but it's basically the same, and this is the, maybe it's even the same data, this is the distribution of the exemplars in the, well, in the stimulus space, in the exemplar space. What's added now, like five years later, for the same group, is what we talked about in this, uh, a minute ago. A report, a subjective report about the similarity of objects. Okay, and this was done just by saying, put those, there was a, they put them all in a bunch and say drag, there was like a drag and drop, just put them up in space, uh, in a way that represents their similarity. They didn't say according to what. Okay, this is something very intuitive. And this is what they got. So, first of all, you can see if you, again, put this uh, in a, reduce this to categories, for example, you can see that the general structure is preserved or it's matching, okay, between the behavior and the representation of, uh, of the, the, the similarity of this, uh, the, the similarity of the uh, stimuli themselves is somehow reflected in the similarity of the patterns, okay, in IT. That's something nice. However, it's much more clustered in the similarity. Um, you can see that uh, also, uh, okay, and this is just how they, uh, again, how they did it. So the first trial, it's very hard to see it. I'm, I'm just going to say it shortly. The first trial, they put everything, okay, um, all the objects, and then each pair, they could re measure the distance, right? Just distance between each two pairs. And then they did some subsets. But the idea is, again, they took each pair, okay? Each pair of objects had a vector here in space representing the dissimilarity, right? Because that's what people did. They represent the similarity. It was put in the RDM. And collectively, we got an RDM now of the perceptual similarity or dissimilarity of objects. Can, can okay. You yes. Yeah, or so one before. Oh, yeah? Yeah, uh, can you explain again what are these trials? The? Trial one, trial two, I don't Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So uh, uh, it's not that important, but uh, in the beginning, the first trial of the experiment, it's behavioral experiment. First trial, they had to um, sort all stimuli. They see it like this, okay. and they drag and drop it like this until they get a uh, final uh, something they're happy with. Okay. Then they move to a subsequent tries, and each try they get a different subset, okay, of uh, of uh, of stimuli, and they have to organize them, and it gives you more dimensions, basically more constraints to your model later, okay. But in the end, you have an average um, for each pair. You have an average. The similar uh, average distance in all these trials, okay, not in all, because not all pairs uh, appear in all trials, but you have some kind of average distance. That average distance between each two uh, exemplars, you just write it here, okay. This is some kind of uh, again, it's not a correlation, but it's actual distance, okay. It's somehow normalized without going into the uh, the whole detail, but it's normalized, and you have some kind of metrics about similarity, okay. So, um, what can you see here? Does this reflect this, basically? What do you think? Well, just to start saying, what, what do you see here? How, how close is this to this? How close is this to this? This is basically the distances, the physical distances, right? It's kind of right. Well, first of all, uh, is there's the big distinction between animate and inanimate? There's something there, right? It's not completely. Uh, it's not as clear as here, as is the in the fMRI data, but it's there. But you can actually say it's even more concise, okay? Because there is. Um, animate in animate difference, but there's also within the inanimate difference, another big difference, and that is, right, this difference. So, within the in inanimate, there's a neutral and artificial distinction that is not there in the fMRI uh, data, okay? And this is reflected also in the 
hyperclustering of data here, of stimuli, okay? So uh, let's say they inanimate and inanimate here. These guys and these guys, right? They are just together here. Okay, so these are the two different groups that you see here, which are not there. So let's say in general, you have some correspondence between the two, you have some differences. Um, what do you, why do you think? Uh, let's think about human, uh, human IT, okay? Um, speculations, why do you see the, the differences? Because there are more regions that are probably involved in... All right. Right, right. So, so human IT is very high visual area, but still a visual area. All right. So it might be more dependent, for example, still about uh, still on visual features, and if you have some semantic, um, purely semantic definition, it will not be reflected here, but only here. And this is actually what they asked, and people said that what they did is first of all decide like, you know, if it's a face or a, or something semantic. If it's a fa if it's a handman tool, if it's a tool, or if it's a fruit, that's what they f did first. And then within the fruit, they use they used more visually uh, guided cues. So once you decided this is a fruit, if it's re if it the I don't know the apple resembles the orange, so you put them together. But the apple and the banana, you put them further apart. Okay. So the tendency of humans was to first do the semantic categorization, and then within it do some kind of uh, uh, distance metrics that is based on visual cues. So, of course, it, the, the semantic part would be of less effect or less reflected in, in human IT, which is still a visual uh, region. Do we know about the semantic part in the brain? Yeah, well, first of all, there is semantic... It's a good question. So, uh, yes and no. I mean... Uh, you have semantic meaning basically in the in the in these areas, these high visual areas. But semantic meanings covariate with the visual features quite like quite nicely, right? They go together. So I would say that in in those uh, um, it's a big discussion about how how visual and how it's still visual the presentation the human IT, all right? But it's like I said, it covariates together with semantic knowledge. Now, as for pure semantic. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's part of a net. I, I would say it's part of a network. You have a basically a some kind of decision that it has to take place in the frontal region. Okay. It, it um, adds up together visual and semantic information that come from the power hippocampal regions. Hippocampus. Yeah. So you, but purely semantic. There's an interesting. I'll find a paper and, and, and I'll send you. There's an interesting uh, kind of uh, um, I forgot the name now. Kind of a, uh, a, a paper that uh, I tried to map the semantic knowledge. I, I'll try to send you. But maybe you know uh, Cassia also, right? I mean, well, if you have multimodal, you have multimodal representation, right? And yeah, but it's still model based. Yeah, it's yeah. like Usually, yeah, it is more like speech or auditory, and I'm not sure if there's like something that is purely semantic knowledge. We did uh, once a paper when I, I, I checked uh, uh, imagery and, and, and perception in two different uh, modalities. Audio, so we had the two by two design, audio imagery, audio perception, visual imagery, visual perception. And we try to see uh, which brain regions participate in which. And what we found is for something that is very um, unrelated to, to, to external stimulus, okay? So let's say the, when you think of a cat, if you imagine the picture of a cat or you imagine the uh, uh, auditor, like the, the voice of a cat or a uh, sound of a cat or, or uh, I don't know, smell of a cat, um, there is some uh, some regions that really light up when, regardless of the modality, just using like imagery and thinking about really about the meaning. Um, but I can say two things about it. First of all, the areas that uh, showed up were like uh, default mode ne default uh, mode network area. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. This is, uh, 
is, is a network of regions that are usually uh, interpreted as, as, as they're, they're active when you're not doing some exogenous related task. Okay, so you, there are many interpretations of, of that. Uh, usually they talk about some kind of uh, mental, I don't know, probably you know more about it, but some kind of uh, like intrinsic thinking or, or stuff like that, but I'm, it, it, it's debated. Okay. And, and answer your question, I don't think that because people uh, were using that system when they had to think about something uh, in, in detachment from the, from the sensory part, that, that that network actually represented semantics. No, it represents, uh, uh, it's part of a process that is recruited when you think about, uh, about, sem about semantics of things without uh, a signal from outside, without, without a stimulus, okay? Um, and I personally think, I, I, from that experiment, my, my, my experience from that work was that it's very hard to detach a semantic notion from a stimulus representation. Even when you think about the word semantics, I, 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 I see the word semantics, I see it written. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. It's very hard to dissociate. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you're doing, uh, you're doing uh, right? We talk now about uh, the meditation you do. I don't know what, what you can reach there, but... but I know, but you don't think. But the purpose is not thinking about a, about a cons, ab, about an object. Try to think about. I don't know. I I, I reach the conclusion that it's very hard. There is no such representation that is not linked to a modality. That, that's my. But I don't think it's like. An, I can answer there that. Is no, you say there is no representation. No, no. I, I'm, I'm saying, for example, when you think about semantics, so like uh, Cassia said, you you you. Think about the vernica area, or some frontal regions. You 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 use all these to to think about that object, okay? And probably the uh, uh, human IT is the, the more prominent aspects are the visual ones, and the vernica, the more prom prominent aspects are the, the you know the word, the the the, the 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 verbal description of that of that thing. But do we do? Are you able to think about something without attaching? any kind of visual or auditory uh, something to that? I, uh, for, I, I believe not, but I'm, I'm, I don't have the answer, okay? Yeah, there must be a top-down. Top-down, yeah, of course. There is interaction between these two, but there is no, well, I think there is no just one node that they, they, they interact, they act together, yeah. right? It's a, it's a system, right? You use the, 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 the whole yeah, thing. But so, so you have influence from non-visual for sure, this area is dominant by visual features, and for sure it has some um, um, connection with non-visual elements or features of yeah, that so specific uh, concept that you are now thinking about. All right? Yeah, because the division is conceptual, even in the Yes, 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 because it is affected. All right, there, there is association. Right? You, you, you see a face, you, 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 you associate the visual face with some kind of word you think. Maybe if that face reminds you of somebody else, you also associate it with some uh, personal or, or some kind of... Uh, so, of course, everything, uh, everything acts. But in terms of decoding, right, here you probably decode it um, by some kind of combination of, um, yeah, of, the, of, the categ of the category and the visual features. Now, when you classify it, it's very only classified, you can say something about, okay, it's an animate and animate. Uh, here, for example, you can model, again, if you can this, put this according to categories and subcategories, on the one hand. On the other hand, you have a model that you have a gradient change in, uh, um, I don't know, um, again, color, size, uh, shape, contours. If you can put that, you can see how this uh, um, specific, again, specific stimulus uh, set, uh, how, it, uh, how is the data represented there, according to what factor, okay? And I'm, I'm guessing, and maybe I'm even showing it later, I'm not sure, that in these uh, regions you won't see any continuum according to simple shape, that's for sure. It might be uh, really a semantic thing, probably with some kind of complex feature that is, is relative. For example, 
maybe the round shape together with the distribution of colors and the spatial distribution of the, I don't know, eyes and the, the like sub-elements of the face, all these together are some kind of complex model that would explain this, uh, this uh, division. All right, so let's get back to, uh, to business. Uh, that was also business, but back to the plan. Um, so here you can see, again, by uh, visualizing uh, this with a dendrogram, you can see the commonalities and dissimilarities between the activity pattern and the judgment. All right? So like we said, the basic uh, um, structure is there. However, for example, in an animate, you can clearly see this uh, natural and artificial division in the perceptual uh, um, judgment that we didn't see there. Although there's some parcellation within the inanimate uh, uh, stimuli, but it's not as structured as here. This is, again, just a reflection of this structure that doesn't exist here. Okay, so again, this is only visualizing, but it's a very, very powerful tool because um, you can read, see it really clearly and also quantify it. And, as I said, you can... Um, use these dendrograms and these MDS to just show the data, right? See the clustering of the data. You can measure this clustering that you see and come up with insights. But you can also have some kind of assumption or some kind of a hypothesis, a hypothesis that, uh, that you can test directly. And this is, uh, this is going back to what uh, I said before about this... Um, about this uh, um, representation of space that are translated into the RDMs. And you can test uh, how much each of these models or uh, division of the data explains, how much variance it explains. So for, we don't go over all of it, but just for example, we have this animate and animate uh, distinction which will create this kind of uh, matrix, okay, with these uh, uh, highly similar and these dissimilar. You have face body, okay, um, which will, uh, again, because they order the stimulus in a certain way, this is what you expect to get if that is, the, is what explains the data. You have a human in human, which is, again, what we just saw. This is the human in human, okay. And you have some other, uh, okay, other um, uh, uh, models that you can check. And now what you can do, what they did, it actually uh, made a kind of a GLM, okay? They uh, said, okay, some combination of, maybe, some combination of all of this explains the data. Now we try to put the weights differently in such a way that minimizes the difference between what we get and the actual data. It's exactly what you do with the other GLM. They did a GLM on the, on the data they have, basically, find out the best linear combination of those. Okay, maybe the best is not so good. So maybe the best will be only like explaining 70% um, of the data. Maybe it will explain 90% of the data. But whatever it does, so first of all, we understand if this maybe some can explain the data by, some that, by this combination. And if so, maybe we can have some, uh, something smart to say about the relative contribution of all of this. Okay? Um, uh, to cut to the chase, this is, this is what they found. Um, so first of all, um, oh, I don't have the, <laughs> the, the colors here. So let's see, the animate in animate is the red, and the face body is the purple, and then, uh, okay, I should have had it here. But what you can see here, first of, first of, all, first of all, is um, the variance, uh, the variance explained uh, in the patterns of activity, which are dominated by the inanimate and animate. So if I would just try to describe what, what's happening in this big matrix, okay, by animate and animate, I will explain a lot of the variance, okay? This is just, uh, I don't remember if this uh, variance explained, it seems a lot, but uh, explain category variance. It's 80% of this. It's not any percent of the variance explained, I think. It's 80% of what we were able to explain is explained by... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
sigma of beta is 100 percent. Never mind. This is 100 percent, okay? And 100 percent is able to explain, I don't know, maybe 90 percent of the data. But mo most of what we can explain is captured by the animate in animate distinction, okay? By, uh, uh, and it, this is quite different, well, not uh, completely, when we talk about the perceptual uh, um, uh, uh, judgment. So again, half of what we can explain is still by animate in animate, but we can see two other factors here, which again, I'm sorry for not putting this here, are the art, uh, natural artificial and the human in human uh, um, elements. Okay, so we have uh, two definitions that are not in here. Again, it's a different way of looking at what we just saw in the dendograms, okay? But this is done by an assumption that you have some categories. So one is done by just putting the data there and describing the clusters you see, and one is done by trying to estimate with some kind of educated guess, okay, with some kind of model that is, is we're not just estimating it, try to estimate which one of the models is uh, contributing to the variance. Yeah, so the color is the beta weight. So this is the, the weight that, uh, so um, in animate, animate in animate has the highest beta here by far. Okay, it explains most of the data. And what you can see is when you do the same thing for the uh, human AT, this is the same, it's just different persons. Okay, so the data is a bit different. And you do this with the monkey uh, data, you can see that it's not the same, but the division is much more uh, similar. Okay, and again, it tells us two things. First of all, that like we just discussed, um, the information or what we can see in the patterns uh, of information in human IT is not capturing the whole story. It's, it's, still, it's very rich data, but it doesn't match um, behavior uh, completely, right? So again, there is some kind of semantic, semantic. Uh, considerations that are implemented here but are not reflected here. And the other thing is that the monkey and human data is remarkably similar. We saw that before, but this is another way to show it. And it's not only remarkably similar, at least in terms of explained variance, variants, this is more similar than this. Okay, so we have a nice combination of um, between species uh, um, comparisons and uh, and and uh, between uh, um, perceptual judgment and uh, and human fMRI activity, okay? So we have this triangle of of of, of things we measure, and you can see how if we have a triangle of again of a monkey uh, data, human fMRI data, and uh, human uh, uh, behavior data, right? We can see that these two are closer. It's not exactly closer, right? Where measuring two different things here. But you can see that in terms of analyze the, of, of population, when you analyze the population of voxels in human IT or population of neurons in, uh, in monkey IT, you get a, a, a similar representational space, which is a bit different. We don't have what we're missing here is the monkey behavior, of course, but um, you get the idea. Okay, so is that clear? The basics and, and, uh, and why is this so powerful? Okay. What they went to do next, what's the time there? Okay, I have a couple of minutes, right? Uh, what they went to do next is even extend that further. I'm thinking if I'm gonna, yeah, I'll start this. Um, and they check um, also the individual difference. Okay, so this is another thing that you can do. You can check. Um, First of all, the robustness of the system, and this is uh, of, the, of the approach. This was done separately. And then you can use this uh, robustness of, of approach, of the, and by, by robustness of approach, I mean if you do this analysis on this part of the data, and after a week, let's say, you do it again, how reproducible is it, how, how, how solid it is, okay? Um, that serves you as a baseline, for example, if, and now you want to test the difference between two subjects, okay, between two people. You know how one subject, if you do this analysis like three times, you know how the data behave, you know the, the, the level of, uh, of variability you have. Now you can try to see if um, 
to the, to um, using this space that we created with this stimulus. This is exactly they're going to use uh, different sets of stimuli. That's exactly the same idea. Is this uh, stimulus space is very different between individuals, okay? And also, you can, like, like I said, we can correlate it to behavior. So we can see, let's say, if uh, one person, okay, tends to organize the stimuli differently, is that being is that being reflected in the difference also in the in the pattern similarity? Okay, so this is a very very powerful tool again because it gives us one the metrics of the of the of the of the space and second the the means to compare it with models and um, and behavior. Sorry. Yeah, so, so this is another thing here. I'm, I think I will leave it. By, so, so what they also want to see if there is an effect of familiar objects here, which is they do find some kind of effect. I think it's too, like, yeah, too detailed uh, for now. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it next week. But, they, but it's true. They, they did it on uh, two different uh, groups of objects. One is just non-familiar, like what we talked about now, up until now. The other... Um, the other group of objects was half of, the, half of it, 18 objects were from what you chose, from your personal life. The, the other 18 was what somebody else chose, all right? And then you were able to, to do the, what I just talked about now. You were able to first, let's say, that's your subject one, so you do this two times, okay? And they create some kind of baseline. How reproducible is the matrix for you? Okay, that serves as a baseline. And then they check if uh, you have uh, some kind of correlation between your own two RGMs. Let's say it's six. Now uh, they, they check uh, um, the correlation between your uh, RDM and another one's RDM and see if it's higher or lower. You get an idea if there are differences between them. Okay, but they can do this analysis once for between people who use the uh, familiar objects and one when they use non-familiar objects, okay? So that's another distinction. But the idea, um, the idea is the same idea, and I'm, I'm going to finish. I have these slides and one other. You, cre you have um, stimuli, familiar or not familiar. You, com you have a pattern, you compute the similarity. For each pair of stimuli, you have one spot in the matrix create this RDM matrix, now you can, of course, take these values of distances, plot them on uh, some kind of space, you see a grouping, clustering of objects, and you have the basic RDM. If you ha if here you have 36 objects, it's the same 36, so again, main diagonal is always zero, because these are completely matching, so we can use only half of it. Okay, so up until now, it's the same idea, only using 36 um, familiar objects instead of 92 unfamiliar objects. And this is what I talked about before, and this will be the final slide. So if you have uh, your uh, representation in that particular brain region, it's again human IT, in day one, and then you, use, you do the same uh, um, experiment in day two, you have some, uh, some kind of correlation coefficient between these two, and the same for the other subject, and this is we're, we're only talking about brain representation at the moment. Then you can check these cross correlations and see if they are higher or lower, okay? So you've got two um, uh, sets of, uh, of, of um, correlation of uh, uh, results. These are the correlations, so you see that uh, the correlation for uh, within subjects are higher than correlation between subjects. They're both significant, so they're both, both robust, okay? And then they have this index, and they do it for many subjects, of course, and the index is basically tells you if the difference between st these two is significant, okay? The idea that if it's significant, you have some um, individual changes, consistent changes. So your representation is consistent, uh, uh, my representation, your representation consistent, but between us, there are consistent differences between the co two consistent, uh, uh, right? So a lot of consistency here, but, uh, but, but that's the idea, and they found it in the human IT, and the details, again, are not so uh, important, but it's 
again, nice to, nice to see that you can actually track these kind of, again, stimulus by stimulus differences. The next idea, uh, next step, of course, was to uh, see if the same, uh, the, the same is reflected in the uh, perceptual judgment. So what they now did is instead of taking uh, brain activity in day one and day two, they averaged the activity and again checked the uh, correlation like we just did, we just saw, to uh, perceptual judgment. And again, you can get a certain correlation here. We saw there's some of, uh, well, considerable part of the variance here can be explained by the way you perceptually grouped the, the stimulus, okay? And these are again here. So they are less, uh, less strong, which makes sense. It's not the same type of data, okay? We saw that the, the perceptual uh, judgments are not exactly the same as the brain. And then you can uh, um, do the same cross uh, thing. So you compare your, the way you order the uh, stimuli, stimuli in space to the way they are represented in the other subject's brain, okay, or human uh, or the inferior temporal cortex. And again, what you see here is that you have some consistency, but there's also a difference between two. So it seems that your uh, brain activation consistently captures what you, your perceptual decision better than the other one's brain activation. So it's also a very nice way to show first that you have some uh, individual differences that are represented in the brain and that correspond to behavior. Okay, and I think I'm already late in two minutes, so what we'll do next, uh, next week, I'm not here. Uh, last, um, yeah, it's going to be last uh, class. We're going to have first hour, I'm going to finish, we're going to have uh, still go over searchlight, and then I'm going to go back and give you a bit of the big picture and kind of organized thing towards the exam, okay? Um, so, I want you first, those of you, I guess, um, especially you here and the other parts of this. We're going to have a, I already published, but you need to answer. I'm going to have a fMRI, uh, the MRI visit in the MRI unit. That's one thing. The other thing, whoever is doing the test, even if you're not doing the test, please write me that you don't do the test. Okay, so I remember. And if you do the test, uh, pick one of the, I don't know, six, seven dates that I'm going to post uh, later and do it by this week. Okay, I'll write everything down. And other than that, um, I'll see you in two weeks. I'll prepare everything. Questions? Uh, you can leave, but if you have questions, I can stay. All right. <laughs> it's, it's late in the day. Yeah. Okay. It takes it took time to get us to the really interesting stuff, but yeah, but that's that's how it goes.